Hello, I'm Esther Vida. Welcome to Saw News, bringing you news, views, and entertainment from the South Asian community in the United States. Hello, I'm Esther Vida, backstage at the Democratic National Convention in Denver. Join me tonight on North Carolina Now as I bring you a conversation with two women who got prime time spots to give speeches at the convention. Our goal is to introduce you to citizens who in their own unique way contribute to the betterment of society. They could be part of a charitable or faith-based organization, spend a lifetime giving of themselves, or do small acts of kindness. President Barack Obama's new immigration overhaul may help at least 800,000 young undocumented citizens avoid deportation for two years. But how does this affect the Asian American community? Police have not found a motive nor have announced a suspect in the killing. Pakistan successfully tested a ballistic missile capable of carrying nuclear power just days after India launches its own long-range missile. According to an email acquired by the Associated Press, a U.N. mine removal expert says there are unexploded cluster munitions in northern Sri Lanka, possibly responsible for the death of a boy. Americans of Indian descent have won the B five times in a row and in 10 of the last 14 years. That's our show for tonight. Thank you to all the heroes out there for all that you do. And if there is someone, an organization, a group, or perhaps a team that you would like to nominate to be featured on Hometown Talents and Treasures, email me at estherandvida at gmail.com. Remember, it can be anyone. The important thing is that they selflessly donate their talent and time to help others. Consider this, in the 1960s, most of its citizens were illiterate. Today, Singaporean students rank first in international math and science competitions. So how did this tiny Asian nation become such a powerhouse? Before landing here at Port-au-Prince, the plane had to circle around three times. That's because there's only one runway here. And imagine this, there's dozens of countries trying to land and help. There's also nonprofit organizations. This is one of the biggest problems the Air Force had had in trying to get personnel and equipment here to Haiti. Singapore's labor force has gone through a drastic transformation in the past 45 years. From the 60s, when most of the people were working in the garment and textile industries, to today, where there's a large pool of people working in the biotech, IT, and banking industries. How did it happen? Government officials say it's a carefully orchestrated plan. Technology is changing at a fast pace, not only in Singapore, but also around the world. That's why educators are constantly trying to find new ways to engage students. This model home is an example of how students can keep in touch with teachers all day long and continue learning even outside of the classroom. Standing in the heart of Bangalore, down the road is Dell, IBM, Microsoft, and many other big companies. This area is known as the Silicon Valley of Asia. In fact, many economists say that India has one of the fastest growing economies in the world. So why are these companies setting up shop in India? Part of the reason that I, I for this trash can, not just an ordinary trash can, but it's, you know, it's kind of a fashionable yeah. trash can. And you said that another thing that's really important for these families um, are pretty things to decorate. Absolutely. We Do have families or people ever come back to you after years? Or are there any success stories, tangible, in terms of, you know, now they've got their basics, are they able to move ahead in life? Absolutely. Some of the, my favorite things to watch in the highlights is you jumping into <laughs> Nicole's arms after every game, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. After like all of our big games, we just like find each other celebrate together. Yeah. <laughs> so. They deserve every accolade that, that's been given them, so uh, I'm really proud of them. What are you going to do next year? I don't know. We'll <laughs> see. You know, we've got a good, you know, we've got a good crew coming back. You know, we have Jack Alois and Devin Cadney who have sort of like these two, you know, have been playing since their freshman year. And uh, I saw that look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did Honestly, we catch yeah, that on yeah. the camera? <laughs> I'll ask you about the budget you signed. You, saw, you said it wasn't the best budget, although you reluctantly a sign that um, back in January during your State of the State address, you talked about North Carolina's currency that we will not hurt education in North Carolina. You even said that we would increase per pupil spending. This budget makes significant cuts to education. Do you think this will hurt 
or change the education here in North Carolina? I think at the end of the day, when you add in the recovery dollars. The war in Iraq. Yes. There are those that say the insurgency has worked. There are those that say it doesn't. Regardless, it has raised a lot of questions about the role of the United States in these hot spots. We've seen Pakistan, Iran, we've just recently mm -hmm. Georgia. When do we draw the line of going in or being just bystanders? Well, I think it, it depends on the individual situation. For people watching across the state who may never have visited downtown Raleigh, I want to give them a perspective of where this event is taking place. In a one block radius of this event, we've got the General Assembly and they're reconvening on January 28th. Down the block is the Lieutenant Governor's office and this is a position that was held by Beth Perdue for eight years and it's a position now being taken over by Walter Dalton. Now, down down the road is the old state capitol, and after the swearing-in ceremonies of today, that is where Beth Perdue will be taking office. And as we get into this... Videographer Mike O'Connell and I recently flew out of Pope Air Force Base to Haiti for a same-day relief mission. The mission began like many others, carrying crew and cargo. But when the C-130 cargo plane returned to the United States, it carried a very special group of orphan children. Three weeks after the first catastrophic quake rocks the tiny Caribbean nation of Haiti, U.S. relief efforts continue to be deployed from Pope Air Force Base. You're literally the pebble, you're a pebble in the pond. What you do was going to have an effect for a long period of time. On the flight we accompanied were members of the 95th Civil Affairs Brigade from Fort Bragg. They're a highly specialized group on a three-month mission to help Haiti get back on its feet. Uh, right now the mission in, in Haiti is dealing with the assessing phase and then synchronization, coordination. Our end state and our end goal is to have a country sustainable, to sustain itself so that eventually they don't need us, they don't need any other type of foreign military or hopefully any, any other type of foreign aid. You want to get them up on their feet. The plane is cold, noisy, and there's not a lot of wiggle room. Some of the crew try to catch up on sleep. As we approach the capital of Haiti, Port-au-Prince, next to our craft, there are half a dozen other planes flying in the same direction. In the water, countless relief ships approach the port, including the USS Comfort. We circle around three times for about 20 minutes before we're given the okay to land. Those on prior flights say initially the wait was much longer. Once on the ground, the crew moves quickly into action, unloading the equipment and supplies. The airport is a frenzy of activity. There are planes, armed personnel, relief workers, and military and non-military vehicles zigzagging all over the runway. Refugees sit in rows under tents to avoid the blazing sun. They wait patiently for their turn to get on a plane. The small airport's terminal is condemned, so there's nowhere else to wait but outside. Soon we are informed that the aircraft will be carrying passengers back to the United States, 45 orphans and 10 civilians accompanying them. What's the state of mind of these children? I think they're really excited. They're sweet. Uh, they're excited. They, they're looking at airplanes and a lot of... Uh, happiness, no, no real fear, maybe some exhaustion, but not fear. We try to speak to some of the children. Many don't speak English, and understandably, we're overwhelmed by all the commotion. My name is Fabulous Lachlan. And where are you from? Fabulous Lachlan. Some of the children lost their families in the earthquake. Others come from orphanages and have been in line to be adopted by families in the United States. From Miami, where are they going? Uh, hopefully to their families. All over the country? I think they're all over the place. We've seen uh, Utah, Colorado, uh, a lot of eager families hoping to get their hands on their new babies. And because of the quake, it's been expedited. Yeah, that's exactly right. Like this father from Florida, many have been waiting for years for the adoption process to go through. Yeah, just dealing with all the, the bureaucracy of the Haitian government and, and just, it's just been a long process. What is it like to finally get through your children? Uh, it's been quite the adventure. It, long time coming. It's, uh, this particular trip has been incredibly exhausting, but it's well worth it to have her knowing that our children are coming home. Bit of relief? 
Oh yeah, as soon as I step foot on that plane, I know that we're going because it's been it's been a really chaotic trip. Before boarding the aircraft, U.S. and Haitian officials reviewed documents and discussed details of the orphan's departure. Others, like ICE Supervisor Mackie Spear, offered the children a safe place to rest. She doesn't look like she wants to let go of you. I think she's pretty comfortable. I think she feels kind of safe right now. And for a while, the children can rest knowing they are in safe hands. But there are a lot of unknowns ahead and thousands who still need to be rescued. How do you feel about all the children that don't get this opportunity? That's a, that's a tough nut to crack. You can only help so many, so you help those you can, and you wish for the best for the rest. After less than two hours on the ground and more than 12 hours after the mission started in Fayetteville, the air crew of the C-130 prepared the craft to carry their newest cargo, 45 Haitian orphan children to their new home. The United States. What do you want to say to the troops, to Americans who getting you out here? Thank you. In part three, watch as the orphan children land in Miami and we debrief with Colonel James Johnson, commander of the 43rd Airlift Wing and installation commander at Pope Air Force Base. We talk about the historic nature of Operation Unified Response.